And um, first, I, I want to say that it is awesome to have uh, men of God, uh, people of God who can come and who can share a word with you from the Lord and uh, teach from his scriptures. Uh, we are a teaching church. Many of you who are D-wayers, regular D-ways, you know this, you understand this. Those of you who are watching online, this is probably one of the reasons why you even do so. And I'm just so thankful that from uh, Art to Pastor Mac to Pastor Mike, uh, you got a word from the Lord. And I just, let's just honor those gentlemen uh, for the work they did standing in for me. Amen. Amen. Um, that was awesome. And uh, I, I actually had vacation scheduled. Um, I had two weeks of vacation scheduled, but I also needed back surgery. I uh, needed a micro discectomy. Um, and for, for those of you who are familiar, I, I had a herniated disc, L5-S1, which is the lower part of your spine, and I needed to have that repaired. And so my first day of vacation was surgery for me. Um, so my vacation w wasn't all that much of a vacation. Uh, it was more like a time of healing. Um, but something else happened to me after my surgery. Like a week and a half before the surgery, I got the first dose of um, the Pfizer vaccine. And four days after the surgery, I got the second dose. And the very next day after I woke up, uh, after getting the second dose, I woke up with shingles. Oh. Listen, I didn't have a lot of back pain from that surgery. But those shingles, those are the worst. <laughs> you do not want those. If you are somewhere near 50 and you can get the vaccine and you've had the chicken pox already as a child or something like that, I urge you, get the vaccine for shingles because shingles are no joke, no fun. So um, I added another week and, and I'm glad I did. I, I really needed that week between the shingles. I think what happened with me is that uh, between the vaccines and the surgery, I think my immune system, my body was just like, okay, Ron, this is too much. We can't hold back these shingles anymore. We're so sorry. And I spent a week or so with this really uncomfortable burn and itching that comes. Um, it's, just, it's just bad. It's not good. Um, and and I, want to, I want to thank some folks because there were some folks who were such a blessing to me uh, while I was recovering. I want to thank Bridget and the Blake family. I want to thank Pierre and Brittany Lewis, uh, Art and Juanita Hartman. Uh, Clint Bolton Jr. and the Bolton family, Ashley Carnegie, Chris and Danielle Ellison, South Zone, West Zone, Central Zone, North Zone. Uh, I want to thank you guys so much. And I cannot forget Roy and Tara Mitchell. I want to thank you guys, all of you who were such a blessing to me as I was recovering. Uh, that was just, I, I can't tell you how, how much of a blessing that was. Uh, there was, in fact, one day where we had so many edible arrangements, we didn't have any room in the fridge for all these edible arrangements that came to the house. Uh, but truly, I just thank you guys, um, and, and, uh, and I'm glad to be back with you. All right, I think I have covered everything. You guys ready to get into the Word of God together? Amen. Amen. Let me just say something quick about zones. Zones are so awesome. Uh, all of the members of Designer's Way live in places all over Tampa Bay. And because of that, we have divided into zones, right? Every, wherever you live, there is a zone. And one of the awesome things about zone, my zone just lost a young lady. Many of you guys know Miriam. Miriam was a North Zone member, and she has switched up on us. And she is now a Central Zone member. But one of the things that I recognize that she made that transition is the awesome things about Zone is wherever you move to, you already have brothers and sisters from your spiritual family in your area. So Miriam moves to the Central Zone. She's already got brothers and sisters there who she, who she can fellowship with and find out more about our area. It's just one of the great things about the zones that we have here at Designers Way. If you do not know where your zone is, then I, call the church office, send an email to info at designersway.org. If you're on River, you can hit somebody up on River. You can just go into the main channel and ask, hey, where's my zone? And we will hook you up and make sure that your zone is that you know who your zone leaders are and you connect with the folks in your zone. These zones are the most awesome thing uh, in terms of our fellowship and connecting with one another and our spiritual family. Amen? All right, all right. 
do me a favor. I know since we, we haven't done this in a while, um, as we have not really been in the sanctuary together uh, in some time, and uh, even when we came back, it took a little while for us to get back into the swing of things. But do me a favor. If you've got your Bible with you or your phone or your iPad, whatever you use to access the Word of God, do you mind throwing it in the air for me and holding it up there for just a moment? And just say this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, show me the truth of your Word so that I can walk in its ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians Chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. I have a word from the Lord that I want to share with you this morning. I don't often talk about the titles of the messages, but this message has a title, and the title is Being the Bear. Being the Bear. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to begin. And uh, Jared, don't move yet. I'm about to pray for you. And uh, I know he was thinking, I'm going to start. <laughs> I heard about you, Jair. I was watching those messages. I heard about you. <laughs> uh, if, now, let's begin to pray. Let's go before the Lord quickly. Heavenly Father, we just love you and we honor you. and We thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to sit at your feet. God, to hear your word. And Father, what my prayer is this morning is that as we live in a time where so many people feel that your word is filled with great suggestions and great pieces of wisdom. As we live in a time where people feel like your word isn't absolute, what I pray is that your Holy Spirit would confirm in all those who are yours, that your Holy Spirit would confirm in all those who belong to you, all those who call upon the name of Jesus and declare him as their Lord, that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to see truth clearly this morning in your word as we study together. I pray, Father, that those who are far from you that, Lord, those who perhaps don't serve you, don't live for you, those who even, even may not believe in you and may be here or watching today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do something miraculous in them as you quicken their understanding of your word. That, God, we would all have an understanding together. For we know that your word does not return to you void. We know that it is forever settled in heaven. We know that your word is truth. And as we study it, Father, we want your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see that truth clearly, open our ears to hear it clearly, open our hearts to believe and receive. For we know that if we have your truth and apply it to our lives, that we will walk in the light as you were in the light, that we'd have fellowship with one another but that also we would walk in the truth of your blessings. And so, Father, we pray that you would move in these moments as we study. I pray that you would use my mouth as a mouthpiece, my body as a vessel to do with as you will to speak to your people this morning, that we would all hear, including me. And so, Father, we thank you for all you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So we began this year with a theme, and I got to tell you, I, I watched all the messages, and I need to say this, Mike, I watched all the messages, and Pastor Mike uh, had me envious in his message. I, I, was, I was suffering with some envy. That envy was because Mike was so dynamic. He was bending down, and he was twisting, and he was moving, and after I just had this back surgery, I cannot move like that. And I was watching Mike as he preached now, just like, my God, I, I wish I could bend. I wish I, <laughs> I, was, I was struggling watching Mike preach. It was so dynamic in this presentation, had me envious of all that movement. But as, as we have started this year, um, the Lord has set us on a theme. Our theme has been recover, refocus, rebuild. Recover, refocus, Rebuild. I love the way Leah is saying yes. Like she's well aware of what the focus has been for this year. And this is, this is crucial to us because as I see that the Lord is speaking this to us, I also recognize that this is multi-layered. Whenever God gives a theme to us, I notice that the theme tends to be true in the lives of some individuals. The theme can be true in the body of the church, the overall community. The theme can just be true in general for what God is doing here. And I believe that I see all three. I... I recognize that there are some things that we need to recover from that are not just about COVID-19, not just about 
2020, not just about leadership of the country, not just about all of these various things that we've had to deal with, social unrest and social justice and all of these different kinds of things. There were things that we've been struggling with even long before 2020 that God is adjusting and correcting and fixing in this moment. And if we are wise enough to see those things, wise enough to become aware of those things, then not only can we recover, but we can refocus. That we can begin to see what we have not seen for a long time. There are things that God wants us to be aware of that we have not seen because we've been in different spaces in our minds and different spaces in our understanding. But now is a time where God is making some adjustments so that not only can we recover, but so that we can refocus. That there has to be a general understanding of what God is ultimately doing and what he's ultimately said. There's been so much that we've dealt with in these years that have truly come because we've all been really loose with what God has said. That we haven't always held in the most firm regard the truths that he has laid out before us. Recover, refocus. If we can recover and we can refocus, then we can get to a place where we can rebuild. Oh, Christianity suffered a mighty blow. These past, this past year. The reality is Christianity has been dealing with, for, with, dealing with this for many years, but there are aspects and some things that have come to a head in 2020 that have revealed that we have missed it in some areas. Recover, we focus, we build. And so what God has done as we've been talking about this, the first, one of the first places that he helps us to deal with well, where he's been helping us to deal with recently, one of the things that he's been showing to us recently is community. Oh, be, because we have not necessarily been doing community in the right way. Because we haven't necessarily been practicing community for the right reasons, utilizing community in the ways that he desires us to. We started out talking about how vital community is in regard to even how your brain is made up, that God created and designed the right side of your brain to work in a way to where your relationships affect your character development. We talked about that in the series, Set It Off on the Right, y'all. And then after that, I then started to talk to you about trust, right? We did a message where we talked about trust, who to trust, because as important as it is to have intimate relationships to not only your character development, but also to real joy, you can't have intimate relationships if you don't know who to trust, or else many of those intimate relationships will become a disappointment. And many of those intimate relationships will do more harm than good when it comes to your development of your character, but also with your walk with Jesus. See, we have to have relationships with people who are genuine believers. I'm going to break the, for those of you who are watching. I, I'm hoping right now, in the name of Jesus, someone watching on the Facebook will write genuine believers because I'm about to break this down. This is important. I'm talking about genuine believers because what we find today and what I found throughout 2020, even and especially in the political world, is that there are a number of people who will utilize the moniker Christian to describe themselves, but yet their lives are very much not like Christ. And so genuine believers are people who it's important to have intimate relationship with. And I was saying, in fact, when we did that message on trust, that one of the ways that you can see genuine belief is found in something that Jesus said in John chapter 15. I've never noticed this, but Jesus, in John 15, he says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants because servants don't know what their master is doing. But now I call you friends because I've shared with you all that the Father has shown to me. Here's what I want you to see. Jesus called those friends only who were first servants. We would benefit 
from adjusting our friend pool to the example set by Jesus. Calling those friends. And notice what he says about these friends. He says, I'm moving you from the realm of servant to friend because I can share information with you I can't share with everybody else. So the criteria even for who you can be intimate with would be that of a friend, but the criteria for friendship would be that they were at least at first a servant. And when we're talking about servant, we're not just talking about someone who served with you in ministry. We're talking about somebody who sees Jesus as the Lord. Someone who sees God as the master. One of the interesting things is Paul, in some of the letters that he writes, he introduces himself, and I believe he does this in Ephesians. He does it in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 4. He calls himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus. We're talking about people who see their lives that way, who see the interaction of everyday events as being dictated by God's word and his principles. We're talking about people who honor God so much and his word so much that they're not willing to make excuses to compromise it. Uh, Okay, I went too far. (laughs) Intimate relationships require people who you can trust and the very beginning of who you can trust really is about those who are servants. So as we're talking about this, we can't leave this alone unless we add one more thing. There's one more thing that we have to add to this conversation. That if we're going to be in intimate and close relationship with one another, we've got our zones. If we're going to be in intimate and close relationship with one another, right? If we're going to be sharing intimate truths with one another, if we're going to be experiencing close community with one another, there's one more thing that we have got to consider that we have not yet discussed And it is, how do we have tight-knit community and close relationships in the midst of our imperfections? Jesus died for our sins because imperfection is the human condition. Jesus died for our sins. As we took communion together, we were talking about, as Jesus was saying to this crowd of people, my soul is troubled, that he was, his soul was troubled because he was about to go to a season where he had to endure great physical pain on our behalf, and he does that because we are imperfect. All of us. All of us. Johnny, you, you imperfect. Malik, you imperfect. Whitney imperfect. I wish I could pull. I, I, she's, she's real close, man. First lady's real close, but Evie, you're imperfect. Shaquana, imperfect. Listen, uh, Sterling is close too. That brother, he's close, but Sterling, you're imperfect too. Ebony, oh man. I'm, these are people who are close, but who are still imperfect. We're all imperfect. Listen, as powerful as Pastor Lily is, as she leads worship, As as clear an ear as she has to hear from God, you guys know that Pastor Lily operates in a prophetic anointing. Like, and y'all know that I'm I'm one of these people who I don't I don't use those terms lightly. (laughs) Um, But I've received words from Lily. But in spite in spite of how God uses her and how powerfully He uses her, she's imperfect too. I am imperfect. We are all imperfect. And one of the challenges with imperfection in tight relationship is imperfection is ultimately, inevitably going to cause pain. My imperfections at some point, if we're in a close relationship, are going to rub up against you and there may be pain. If we're in close relationship with one another, your imperfections are going to rub up against me and at some point... I'm going to feel pain. Imperfections causing pain is inevitable. And for those of you who don't know what inevitable means, if you don't, inevitable means it's going to happen. There's nothing we can do to stop it. 
because we are all imperfect. Because of our imperfections, it is literally impossible for us to have intimate and close relationships without at some point hurting one another. Now, I just want to ask you this. Those of you who are online right now in the chat, I just, I just want to ask this question. You can answer the question in the chat. Just answer the question. Do you recognize that that is the reality we live in? Raise your hand if you recognize that. We are imperfect, and at some point, those imperfections are going to cause someone pain. So here's the question. Here's the other question I have for you, though. If we all know that this is the reality why are we so, so shocked? Why do we respond like, oh my God, I can't believe this person hurt me. That Why are we so shocked when imperfection pops up? We already know the condition of humanity. We know it from the scriptures because the scriptures tell us that every one of us is a sinner. <laughs> In fact, the scriptures say that if we claim not to sin, we make God out to be a liar. We know it from experience. All the hurts you've ever had in your life that are not physical, and maybe even some of the ones that are physical, have come from someone else. And yet, when we align ourselves and become a part of a church community, we begin to have this standard of perfection in terms of how we should be treated by one another, that is an expectation that is unreachable. We get involved in a church, somebody in the church hurts us, and man, we are out leaving the church. Sometimes we get in the church, we join the church, we get ourselves serving, we start to love on God, we start to love on some people, somebody hurts us, forget about just leaving the church, some of us leave the faith. <laughs> Because somebody has hurt us. Why are you shocked by that? None of us should be shocked that someone has hurt us, even in the church family. Because the thing that's different about Christians from the world is that we don't claim that everything is all right to do. And we don't claim that we do it all right. We recognize our imperfections, and it's the reason why we depend on Jesus to be our Savior, to wipe away our sins, to cleanse us, and to put imperfect people in a state where they can have a relationship with a perfect God. That being said, I want to look at our text, because the Apostle Paul has a solution for how we do community, close intimate relationship with one another, even in the reality of our imperfections. The Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, pins a specific solution to how we go about having close relationships with people when we're all imperfect. And it's interesting because he doesn't just share this with one church. He shares this with the church at Rome. He shares it with the church at Galatia. He shares it with the church at Colossae. He shares it with the church at Ephesus. He shares this with a number of different churches. The solution to how you have intimate, close relationship, even though we're still imperfect. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1. This is what Paul says. First, he says, as a prisoner for the Lord. I just shared that with you, that Paul saw himself as one whose life belonged to Jesus so much that he couldn't shake the very purpose for which Jesus called him. Because of that, he considers himself a prisoner to Jesus. This is interesting because we also live in a time where there is a kind of We live at a time where the idea of doing whatever you want while still serving Jesus exists. But Paul calls himself a prisoner because he recognizes that he can only do 
what is in the confines of what God has called him to do in his life. And he sees himself as a prisoner because of it. Then he says this, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Every one of you who is in this room, every one of you who is watching online, when you made Jesus the Lord of your life by entrusting your life and soul to him, your salvation to him, when you did that, you actually accepted a call that God had given to you. Some of you were in a church and a pastor or a Christian leader gave an altar call and you felt something in your heart and you responded. Some of you may have been watching a television program, some televangelist, and you heard an altar call, a call to have Jesus as your Lord and something stirred in your heart and you responded. You responded to a call that God had given. When you responded to the call, you responded to a call to become a part of God's family, to become one of his children. And as a result, Paul is saying, well, since you've been called into a relationship that makes you a child of God, then I urge you then to live a life worthy of that call. Oh. Let, me, let, me, let me break it down for you like this. There are some of you in here who are pastor's kids. Some of you who are watching who are pastor's kids. When you are a pastor's child, there is this expectation that you live a life worthy of the lineage from which you come. Now, I do recognize clearly that some pastor's kids... <laughs> kind of feel like that pressure is too much, and they completely buck the system. I've heard stories that some of the pastor's kids are the worst. I don't know. My kids are not like that. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody wants to get hurt. Um, <laughs> uh, but, my, my, but here's the point, though. There's an expectation. We are children of God, and Paul's saying, now that you are children of God, live a life that is worthy of that calling. And then he begins to talk about how to do that. He says, be completely Humble. This is first. The King James Version uses the word lowliness. Oh. Um, you know, in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is urging the folks at Philippi to join together in one mind around some specific things. And what he points out is a case for humility. Because he lays this out for them, and then he says, now have the mindset of Christ, and he begins to describe more about Christ, and it's really about Christ's humility. And what Paul says is he describes the very foundations of humility is he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. So there are a lot of things that we do, but m many of the things we do, we do because we can get something out of it. And what Paul is saying is humility begins with when you can do something even though you're not getting anything out of it. It says, value others above yourselves. So Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, value others above yourselves, and we live at a time where that is really difficult to do. We live at a time where we certainly, the first place our mind goes is, you're not better than me. Rather than, Maybe I would treat you better than me. And Paul is saying, value others above yourself. He's saying, take moments to treat someone in a way where it looks like you're thinking about them more so than you're thinking about yourself. And you value them even above yourself. And it's not a call to feel like you're less than. It's rather a call to make people feel like they're greater than. And then Paul says, express concern for others' interests. Um, so he's saying that humility is rooted in not doing things just because you can get something out of it, showing some value to others that even values them as greater than yourself, and then showing some interest about their concerns 
showing some concern about their interests, making people understand that you care about them, not just you. These are the very foundations of humility. And so when Paul is saying to these people to be humble, this is what he's talking about. And we live in a time where it's difficult to see this. Humility is something that we hardly see. And what's interesting about humility is also difficult to understand whether or not you have it. If you think you have it, you've already failed. You have to sit and ask yourself. And what, what I'm realizing is that there may be some areas where there's some humility, but then there are some other areas where there's definitely some pride. So Paul says, be completely humble. Then he says, gentle. Gentle means a mildness. Gentleness is when you can have a soft touch. And gentleness is crucial because Paul is building up to something here. Gentleness is crucial because it, it's an art to be able to say difficult things in a way that doesn't hurt people. It's an art to be able to find ways to correct or even rebuke or to challenge without hurting people. It requires a mildness and a gentleness. So Paul is saying, be completely humble and gentle. And then he says, be patient. Long-suffering is how the King James translates that. Long-suffering, and it means to be able to deal with some discomfort for a little while. This is one of the things that scares us most because many of us don't like being uncomfortable. We like comfortable. If it's not comfortable, I don't necessarily want to do it. And there are some things that you have to suffer through that are not comfortable. And Paul is saying long-suffering, this patience is a part of this equation for how we bear with one another in imperfection. Because these three things that he's mentioned, this humility, this this gentleness and this patience all play into this last thing he says when he says, and bear with one another in love. Bearing with one another. That means that the solution to dealing with our imperfections, the solution to having close intimate relationship, the solution to having close community in spite of our imperfections is to bear with one another. And in order to bear with one another, you first have to be humble. Because when you're prideful, you're thinking, who are they to be able to do that to me? Who are they to be able to say that to me? And as a result of that, we tend to respond out of that pride. It requires that we be gentle because when people hurt us, what we want to do is hurt them back. You notice that when you have a baby and the baby doesn't know what they're doing and they hit you in the face, nobody hits the baby back. Because there is a gentleness that we want to have. But we don't treat each other that way. And this patience, it's can't, you can't bear with people. Without patience. Do you know what patience really is? Patience is the, the time, gives you the time that it takes to think about humility and to think about gentleness before you respond. <laughs> because most of the time, we get upset with someone and we want to snap. Right then, right there. Patience gives us the ability to process. The ability to think about what would humility do in this moment? And how do I handle this with gentleness? Beloved, we have to bear with one another. This is how you actually get through having these close relationships and intimate relationships with each other with all of our imperfections. We bear them. Pastor Mike hurts me. I bear that pain. With humility, gentleness, I bear it. Patience, I bear it. I don't leave the church. 
I don't cuss Pastor Mike out. <laughs> I bear it. I bear it. Bear means I carry it. We got to have this. And it needs to be, and this, I'm getting ready to close, it needs to be done in a way to where we don't just do it when it's justified or when we think it's justified. And this is a big challenge for us. Recently, there was a Christian leader um, who's, who's very well known who a personal situation he had going became public. And it was found that he missed the mark in regard to a conversation he was having with one of his children. And we know that he missed the mark. There shouldn't be any confusion about this because you look at the beginning, Ephesians, the same chapter we're in, Ephesians 4, down in verse 29, it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Jesus himself said, you know what, if you call somebody a fool, you're in the dangers of the fires of hell. So there shouldn't be any question about whether or not he missed the mark. But what was great and what I'm talking about here is the fact that when he did miss the mark and it became public, as I was watching social media, oh, there were so many people who were willing to bear with the fact that he missed the mark. There were so many people who were willing to be and extend grace. And that's what we're supposed to do. However, the challenge is, why is it that we don't seem that see that same kind of bearing and grace with leaders who fall in sexual sin? Why is it that we don't see that same kind of bearing and grace when leaders fall in some kind of financial indiscretion? Why is it that we don't see that same kind of grace and bearing with leaders who get caught in drug abuse or use? Why is it that we only are willing to really bear and give grace in areas where we feel it's justified? This is why we have to stop trying to be the justifiers. Because we're trying to give, determine who receives grace when God gives grace to all. We're trying to figure out whether or not this is worthy of our grace, worthy of our bearing when God gives grace to all. And this is why it's so important within our community to be able to bear with one another because the grace that God gives to all, we are certainly able to do with one another. This is one of the biggest calls that we have, beloved. That the grace that we have received from him, that we are able to give. I think about it sometimes, you know, when we have leaders who fall, man, they get lit up so bad. And this is not uncommon. It's, you know, this is not something that surprises me from the unsaved world, but it really does surprise me from the saved world. That we would have believers who want to tear down other believers who have failed. And it's scary to me because we think that we have the justification to tear down the falls of others that have become public simply because our nastiness has not been put on display like theirs has. And that is the challenge. We are all imperfect. I was praying for a leader this, this week who I don't know. I, I, I happened to find out that this leader... Uh, had, had fallen in some way, and that this fall had become public. I don't know the leader personally, not at all. I don't know anyone they're attached to. And I was praying for this leader, and considering I don't know them, it's difficult to really pray for them. But what I did pray was, I said, Lord, I pray that you would extend to them the same measure of grace and mercy that I would want if I were in their spot. I may not know what it looks like to be in their position, but Lord, you know what I would do and what I would want if I did. And I pray that you would extend to them what I would want you to extend to me if I were in that same position. 
I don't want to ridicule believers who have fallen. I want to pray God's mercy and grace. And I want to bear with their imperfection. Because I am, I am as imperfect <laughs> as every one of them. We spend so much time trying to make ourselves feel better by pointing out other people's sins that we consider worse. When in reality, if God were to expose our hearts, oh, what people would see. This is why humility is so important in this whole process. Recognizing that you're not any better than anyone else in regard to sin because we are all imperfect. And it is the reason why we have to bear with one another's imperfections. If you're hurt, bear it. Because I promise you, you've either hurt someone else or you soon will. And you're going to want for someone to bear your imperfections. This is why Jesus says, with the measure you use, it is measured unto you. Think about yourself. Anytime someone hurts you because you may have been or will at some point be in that same position. And you're going to want someone who will bear with it. And lastly, if we don't bear with one another's imperfections, we'll never have unity because we'll always be leaving each other. And that's unrealistic and antithetical to very, what the scriptures are calling us to do in regard to unity. The only way we're going to have the unity that the scriptures call us to have is if we bear with one another. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we know that you have been leading us on this journey as we've been talking more and more about community, as we've been talking about relationships and how important relationships are to spiritual formation, spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, as we've been talking about how valuable those relationships even are to real joy, as we've talked about who we can trust, we have now dealt with bearing with one another because the reality is we will never have the kind of unity and oneness that your word calls us to have as the body of Christ, as the children of God. If when we hurt one another, we run from one another. If we hurt one another, we separate from one another. And this is why your Holy Spirit inspired Paul to command the church in Rome to bear with one another, the church in Galatia to bear with one another, the church in Ephesus to bear with one another, the church in Colossae to bear with one another. It's why all of the New Testament scriptures urge us to forgive one another. Often we see the two together, bear and forgive one another because it would be impossible for us to have the unity that you desire if we didn't do those things. And so I pray, Father, that those who are watching today online, those who are in this room, I pray, Father, that these words would be a seed that's planted on their hearts. That this wouldn't just be a sermon that they sit through, but that the truths of your word would fall upon hearts where it would grow and reap a harvest. That our relationships at Designer's Way and in our zones would get tighter and stronger, even as we learn to bear with one another's imperfections and to forgive one another. For that, God, is where we will be strongest as we grow together, mature together, and are unified, one body, one mind, serving one Lord. And so, God, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you will move in our midst as we continue to honor you in our lives in all that we do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank God for his word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right, everybody, before we leave, it is time for us to give in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We are excited about being able to give because the scriptures tell us that God loves a cheerful giver. 
We want to be in accordance with the scriptures. And for those of you who are giving, you know that there are several ways to give. You can give online via the app. You can give in the giving kiosks that are out in the hallway. Uh, you can give in those um, giving vestibules right here by the exits. Several ways to do it. And um, all that you give just goes for the continued upbuilding of the kingdom. And I want to tell you about something that we're actually going to begin to do um, you know, we have not, since COVID happened, we have not been able to do what we've called Code Blue. Code Blue is our outreach ministry, and you guys know that every month uh, we partnered with uh, First Presbyterian Church, who partners with Metropolitan Ministries to feed the homeless. And uh, after all of this, there were a number of things that happened aside from COVID. First Pres, I think they moved to a new location or something like that, and we've just not been able to do that. And... Um, it has been weighing on my heart that we have not been able to give ministry to the homeless in the ways that we have. We've been doing ministry with First Pres for years and years and years. And so uh, we've decided what we're going to do is we're going to financially partner with two ministries uh, that mean a lot to us. Uh, ministries that we've served at Designers Way for years. The first one is Trinity Cafe. For those of you who have been D-Wayers for a long time, you remember where we used to serve the homeless at Trinity Cafe. Trinity Cafe is a great ministry where the homeless people come in and they sit in a place that's almost like a restaurant where people who are serving actually take orders and go get plates of food and bring them out. It's really awesome. That's one half of it. But then on the other side, they have a women's shelter uh, where they feed the women and sometimes the women who have children there in that shelter. So we are going to uh, we are going to give financially to that ministry, and we are also going to give financially to Metropolitan Ministries. Many of you guys are familiar with that. It's almost impossible to talk about all of the different things that Metropolitan Ministries does because they have their hands in a lot of things in a lot of ways throughout the city. And so we've decided that since we have not been able to really be the hands of Jesus throughout this, we are certainly going to give financially and support. Uh, these ministries. And so, you know, a portion of what you're giving is obviously going to that from here on out. And my desire is that that amount for us grows every year as we begin to uh, just give to those ministries because they do great work in the city. Um, and so let's get ready to pray for this offering that you've got. For those of you who are giving your tithes and your offerings, if you're giving it by phone or you've got it with you, hold it in your hand. For those of you who are at home, maybe you're getting ready to press the send button or what have you, let's just pray over it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ability, God, to be able to give back to you a portion of what you have given to us. We recognize clearly, God, that we don't give to try to get something back from you. We're not giving because we think you're going to make us rich or anything like that. What we recognize is that everything we have, we have because you've given it. Every job we have, we have because you've given it. Every dollar we have, we have because you have given it. You are ultimately our source in everything and in every way. And so we give an appreciation and recognition of our source. And it is a privilege, God, to be able to give to you a portion of what you have given to us. We pray that you will multiply it for your kingdom, that, God, you would make ways for us to gather these resources and to distribute those resources in the ways that bring glory to your name. And so, Father, we thank you for the ability to be a, to be a part of the upbuilding of your kingdom and the maintenance of your kingdom, the advancement of your kingdom, and the ministry of your kingdom in countless lives throughout our area. Thank you so much, God, for this privilege in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you all stand really quickly as we prepare to go. You guys know that as we are on this COVID protocol, uh, we get out of here. If you're going to have conversation, we ask that you have those conversations outside. Uh, we don't want to keep you in here too much longer. And uh, let's just close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we've had today worshiping you and hearing from you. We pray, Lord God, that every person who is here and every person who is watching has been edified, that a word was spoken to them that will transform their lives, the relationships they have. We pray that as we worship, that we brought glory to your name, that we would join together in that worship and experience you as a result. We pray that you will continue to bless and keep safe every person who's watching and every person who's here throughout the rest of this week until you bring us back next Sunday to gather as a spiritual family where we worship and magnify and hear hear from you again. Father, we love you. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.